David Bouchard here. Uh, very, very pleased and proud to represent Good Minds as we are into our third or fourth podcast where through 13 moons and 13 reads, uh, Good Minds has been trying to and effectively um, highlighting some uh, Indigenous authors, illustrators, um, artists of all sorts. And uh, we have been bringing them to your attention and allowing them to get some sort of coverage. And it's been wonderful. Um, I'm David Bouchard. I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Lukwagen people. And I say unceded very respectfully because there's no treaty here. Canadians have been living here, not invited for, uh, for centuries. And we have finally, finally stood up and said, we know these lands are yours, the Lukwagen peoples that are composed of two nations, both the, uh, the Songhees and the Esquimalt peoples. And we uh, are very conscious about what we're doing to your land. And we are going to make it up to you in the long run and in the short run, and we're working at it right now. So it's an honor to be here representing Good Minds today. And we, today we're gonna learn about uh, Nika, uh, Nika Gizis, uh, from Debbie Beach uh, Ducharme. And Debbie is Ojibwe from Lake uh, Manitoba First Nation. We knew that that's Dog Creek Treaty 2 territory. Uh, so Debbie, without any further ado, please. Ani Nishnabe, Atikwa, Nidishnikas, Animoti Ding Dunji, Makudu them, Nijikan Gamamagaya Nogam. In my Nishnabe Muin language, I'd introduce myself as Earth Woman. Uh, also known as Deborah Beach Ducharme. I'm from, I'm a band member of Lake Manitoba First Nation. I belong to the Bear Clan. And I just, in my language, said I'm happy to be here today. Today, I'm going to share some information with you about uh, 13 Moons uh, calendar. And the way the 13 Moons calendar works is for many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, the Turtle's Back or the Upper Shell is a lunar calendar. We don't hear too much about our way of understanding the seasons and the months and the days. This was all taken away from us a long time ago. But now elders pass this information on from generation to generation. We're able to talk about it again. So this is our one way of um, ensuring our worldview is maintained and brought down from one generation to the next. This is our way of dating seasonal changes, and all the natural events that occur during each season. In our community, there are four seasons, there are four directions, and this is how we understand the earth and the world around us. There are, are 13 scutes on the turtle's back, as well as 28 smaller scutes on the upper shell. The 13 large scutes represent the 13 moons. The 13 moons occur during one calendar year. The 28 small scutes represent the days of the month. The turtle shell has the same pattern as the moons in a year and the days in a lunar moon. So we understand that the moon takes 13 days to orbit the earth, and this is called a lunar moon. One year, 365 days, there are 13 lunar moons. So it, how it works is the moon completes 13 lunar cycles through the seasons. After each full moon, a small scute is counted until the next full moon, which is 28 days later. It takes exactly 28 days to go from full moon to full moon, which is one lunar cycle. The pattern repeats itself 28 days and completes 13 lunar cycles through the seasons. Each moon is given a name for an important event that occurred during this lunar moon. Moons can change and vary from group to group, depending on the language, depending on the climate, the terrain, or import, important events that occur in that community. At the beginning of each moon, stories are told about the events that occur since the last full moon. And these stories are teachings that are never forgotten once they're told. These stories are passed down from one generation to the next generation. This is how our people ensured that we would never lose this information. The moon we are going to be talking about is Nikigizis. Nikigizis happens in the spring. This moon happens in the spring because it's the time when the summer birds return to our territory. The return of the geese reveals to us that spring is on its way. The coming of this moon represents the beginning of a new year. And that concludes the teaching uh, for this month. 
and stay safe. I will see you again. Miigwech. Debbie, thank you. It's something that we wanted to do. We want to learn. We want to know more about Goose Moon, about Nika uh, and where the where the goose returns uh, every spring on its way. And we knew that it's the beginning. It's that that new life, that new birth. Um, remember, the coming of this moon represents the beginning of a new year for not only Indigenous people, but for all those who don't quite understand it. It's there, uh, and we will be addressing Frog Moon in our next segment. So for now. Um, I get a chance to uh, welcome and introduce you to a wonderful, a wonderful Indigenous author. And uh, Nicola, uh, this for me is an absolute thrill. We're going to get a chance to talk about your new book, uh, some of the things that you've done, some of the things that you're dreaming of doing, and introduce and hopefully excite a number of our, of our listeners and our viewers to, uh, to what you've been up to. Nicola. And Nicola Campbell uh, in Chilliwack, BC, uh, but uh, whose father is from the prairie, and that makes uh, part of her heritage easily for, easy for me to pronounce because Métis is easy, the rest of it is Nicola. Okay, and, well, um, on my mom's side, I'm from the Nicola Valley. Yeah. And I'm in Tlacapamoch and Silk, Thompson and Okanagan from the Nicola Valley. That's where I grew up. Okay, well, now you can understand why I couldn't pronounce that. What a great, <laughs> great spot to grow up. Um, can I start with the obvious? Uh, this for, for our viewers and for our listeners. Uh, Nicola and I are here doing a podcast for Good Minds, and I've said it forever, use it or lose it. They are not only the first, but the largest distributor of Indigenous product in, in Canada, possibly in the world. And uh, we're, we're very lucky to have them there. And Nicola uh, is lucky to have them. I'm lucky to have them. Every Indigenous author or illustrator or artist who knows of their presence, and we all know, uh, promote and try to support. And uh, I'd suggest you hop on YouTube and uh, like them and get a chance to win Nicola's new book. I've seen it in full. Is it stunning? And without wasting any more time, let me say, is there anything else that I wanted to say? Obviously, there, there's a, a day with Yaya, for those who don't know uh, Grandpa. Uh, Grandpa's Girls, and it goes on and on. Um, but her new, most recent book I've seen, and it's, it's stunning. Uh, wait till you see it. It's longer than you would have thought. But I want to make everybody understand this clearly. Uh, Robbie Burns once said that uh, poetry without r rhyme and rhythm is like playing tennis without a net. So when you read Nicola's new book, you make sure you read it aloud. I don't care if you're reading it to yourself or to a classroom or to your family. You read it aloud. It is so, so magical. Because what happens is she worked the text. And I'm not even going to waste any time. What sometimes happens, Nicola, when I've done this, and I've done it before, is that you can see I'm a talker. I'm a storyteller. That's the gift creator gave me. Thus, Raven. Oh, I don't know if you knew that, Nicola. Did you know a family of crows is called a murder of crows? Yes. And a family of ravens is called a storytelling? Oh, really? Yeah. Um, it's uh, We tend to be talkers, and I, I have to always kind of pull back a bit. Sometimes I get carried away, and I and I omit the very best part. So can I ask, Nicola, do you have it there with you, your new book? A prototype? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you think I... you could do a... Oh, man, it's stunning. Come on, go show the cover again. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of art. I know, I know, um, and let's be real clear here. The illustrations are very important, but it's it's the it's the cross between the two. And when you hear, and I, I don't know if you'll be able to read a page and maybe show the illustration, but we'd love you to do a reading. C can we start with that, Nicola? Yep. Um, oh, sorry, sweetie, did you want to tell me about the illustrator? You worked with her before. Oh, well, actually, um, she's been a, f a friend and a sister for um, probably 20, four or so years um it's been a long time and actually she she had hoped to illustrate shishi atko and um that didn't happen it was it was pretty early in her career as well yeah um and kim lafave um he you know he was wonderful to work with as yeah. an illustrator he went above and beyond with all three books, um, traveling up to the interior, and even I think he even met my family. We went to a residential school survivors conference, and we, you know, we did. Re I did a reading of my draft um, of Shinji's canoe, and he showed his pencil sketches to to the elders. Um, so that experience was pretty phenomenal. Um, I know that most illustrators won't do that, and with Carrie Lynn, um, it was it was. A really uh, a natural flow with her because she's Coast Salish. She's uh, right here from here in Stalo territory, Salasoftuma, yeah. and uh, she's a very well-known 
artist and muralist, um, as well as she does a lot of work with um, ecology and land and um, natural resources and uh, especially bodies of water and, you know, like she goes and checks on salmon bearing streams and things. But her yeah, work I... um, is throughout uh, Vancouver and the lower mainland. Um, she's, she's phenomenal. For those who don't know, listeners, uh, there are, we have amongst our people keepers, there are keepers of, of various, uh, and there are keepers of lands and there are keepers of plants and there are, and I don't know that Nicola identifies that way, but there are keepers of stories. And some of our stories are retold and some come from the heart and have to be told. And um, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, and it, of course, you're right to say things happen when they're supposed to happen and there you are together. And I, it could end up being the first in the series uh, fingers crossed. I would love to see the two of you collaborate on a number and, and offer more. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, no, <clears throat> okay, so Stand Like a Cedar. Um, when I first wrote my first draft, um, I was actually inspired by the book I Went Walking. <laughs> and I, was, I had the rhythm in my mind because of um, my, my children, both my son and my daughter always enjoyed. There was I Went Walking and there's um, another one. They're very similar. And what did you see? I seen a brown bear looking at like, me. Brown bear, brown bear. Brown bear, brown bear. Okay. By Bill Martin Jr. Yes, yes, that 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 book. So, I, I I was thinking about it, and I'm always out like on my canoe or I'm out for a run. And and Carrie Lynn does a lot of trail running as well. And I was telling her that I wanted to write a book that was you know I along that line. Yeah. But I was thinking like, how would I indigenize that? concept so that yeah. it brings it home that you know it's it's there's so much more to that experience of being on the land than just what you know a simple what did you see because in every element of what we're doing it comes our teachings and our protocols and and our conduct and, and how we interact with the land and with all the creatures and you know even the spirits of the land so that that was kind of how um stand like a cedar came to be we went paddling in our cedar canoe one rainy spring day. Pouring rain was fresh on our skin and we paddled anyway. The rush and sweep of gentle waves reminded us of the beauty of spring. Who did you hear? Moon swam with us. She shared a song about her spring flight returning from a long winter far away. I am grateful for all newborn animals making their first footsteps across the land. So it's it it this kind of um I've I guess I pondered about how I pondered about how I would um reflect on the seasons and there's mm -hmm. another um, element in here that I thought about afterwards I went I, when I did my first draft and then I went back because and that was that moment with uh, grandfather deer uh, grandfather Schmidt visited us his summer coat was turning grayish brown he shared a story about his descendants and family he explained that death is part of our life cycle he said to honor our tears as though they were stars in the sky. He reminds us to take care of the land. And I, that was important to me because not only does it, you know, explore that relationship with loss and grief and losing loved ones, but it also um, re reminds us to, you know, take, to take care in honor of what our ancestors, you know, taught us uh, since time immemorial. <clears throat> And that sense of, you know, that they're still with us, that the ancestors and our loved ones are still with us. And that's important to me because, you know, we've gone through a lot of losses in our community. Uh, oh, and of course, that's just so typical in indigenous communities across from coast to coast. Hey, good morning, sweetie. She can't hear you. Oh, good morning, sweetie. I'm David. I'm in Victoria. Good morning. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there. How cool to have mom as an author. <laughs> really, and it is the truth. Uh, Nicola, what you said is, is dead on. And uh, right now we're in the um, goose moon, uh, as you probably know, Nika is this. And it's, it's the time of rebirth and the time of so, so much of what you were just saying makes sense. It's just timeliness is. And can I say to educators, if you're a teacher or a parent, 
uh, what, what Nicola was talking about earlier in that rhythm and that sense of repetition that Bill Martin did in Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and he did in a few other books. It's just so, so important. And it's not about having kids learn how to read. It's having kids hear the beauty of, of language. Uh, and when you hear that kind of repetition, it allows them to come to enjoy language. And uh, when I read your book aloud, and of course, what you said about the about the truth about Earth and 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 coming back to our roots. I mean, how, how do you how do you get away from that? And people say, how how do Indigenous people maintain the spirituality? And it's everything that you wrote. It's absolutely everything you wrote. And you just said it in so many passages. And I thought, whoa, do you have a favorite? I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of book there. I went walking one day in late autumn. The world was changing to winter. Snowflakes and golden leaves danced all around. I needed to visit our sacred Timuth, Timuth, Tim Kulah. I needed to feel the cold breath of winter on my skin. Tawet kwa ich se chlam. Who did you hear? A mother shook shook, grizzly bear and her cubs crawled into their cave. She shared a beautiful song about resilience. I am grateful to walk in the footsteps of my ancestors. Their courage to survive ensured our culture and traditions will, be, will always be shared with future generations. I returned to my favorite mountain trail. One sunny winter day, Timuch was covered by a blanket of snow and ice. I went anyway. I needed to visit our sacred Timuch, Timuch, Timhulah. I needed to feel the cold breath of winter on my skin. Tawat kwa ich tsham. Who did you hear? Great halat. Oops. Great skawax and beautiful spawkas. Great, e great raven and beautiful eagle sang among the cedars and Douglas firs. Together they danced in the sky. I paid witness to their honor songs that echoed tremendous love for our Timuch, Timuch, Timchulah. Today we went to the lodge, we went to the lawn house, we went to the mountain, we went to the land, we went to the water, we sat with our elders and prayed. We sang and danced in honor and gratitude of our loved ones. This song is our promise to protect, honor, and respect our sacred Timuch, Timuch, the water that nourishes us, the four-legged, the winged ones, the ones that walk and crawl. We are indigenous. We love to run, paddle our canoes, dance and play. When we need to remember our promises, we stand like cedar trees, hands raised to the sky. We are grateful for all living things. I, I, for one, think it's it's uh, it's, it's everything I, I want people to hear. It's what I would like uh, I'd like non-indigenous people to hear, and it's what I'd like children to hear. I'd like uh, I'd like people to know that you just stand there, raise your arms to the sky, and you and speak to your creator, and and say, I know you're there, and I need your support. And yeah, really. Very, very nice. And the use of language, uh, Nicola, I don't for a second downplay how important that is. And it's one of the little things that's coming back into the world that we didn't do years ago. If people sometimes wonder, why is it that we as a, as a people struggle as readers? I say, just go look in your library. How many books do you see that include our kids, that include us? And there's nobody that's going to want to read unless they can see themselves in a book. And you know how many kids are going to look and they're going to say, I know that. I know that. And all of a sudden, when you slip the language back in, I mean, and it's not easy to pronounce, but I, I say to teachers and parents, go ahead, give it a go, go ahead, give it a go. <laughs> it's so nicely done. Your glossary is so nicely done in the book. Who, is it, who helped you with the language, Nicola? Um, for the Helkamalam is the elder, or from the, for the Intlegep Mokhjin, the Thompson language is the elder from the Nicola Valley. Her name is Marty Aspinall. The yeah. person who helped me with the, with the Helkamalam language. Yes. Um, was Siamia Diana Kay, and she's a language and curriculum development uh, developer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me about some of the books have you written? Just kind of list them off for me. I know you've written, uh, I've, I've got five here on my shelves, yeah. but. Five, uh, five, five children's of... books now. 
Um, Shishi Etko was my first. Shinji's Canoe was a sequel. Grandpa's Girls, A Day with Yaya, and now Stand Like a Cedar. Um, and then I have a memoir. Uh, it, it's poetry and prose stories yes. that's to be released in the fall. Uh, when I say thank you, uh, I know that Good Minds were so anxious to talk to you. They've seen the book. Like me, they know it's going to be a, a huge, huge hit. Everything you've done so far has turned to gold. So there's no reason to think this would. And now we get a chance collectively to wish you good luck. Mm -hmm.